Good morning and welcome to Acts of Coral Live. Really great to have you all with us and I'm very excited for this Meet the Expert live lesson. Now we're broadcasting to you live from the Kamabi Research Station on the island of Curaçao in the Caribbean. Now Curaçao is in the southern Caribbean towards the coast of Venezuela and it makes up one of the three ABC islands together with Bonaire and Aruba. That's where we are and we're at a field research station and it's really really special place to be in Kamabi. Not only are the permanent researchers here but it also provides a home from home for visiting researchers from around the world. A field research station is a combination of two things. It has research facilities so that scientists can work in labs like a dry lab, examining their samples, looking at bits of tissue from the reef under a microscope, perhaps. It also has wet labs where scientists are more able to isolate certain functions that occur naturally out on the reef to be able to study those in greater detail. But it's not only the research facilities that make Kamabi special. In fact, what makes it really special is its proximity to the reef, and that's just out here. So in science, the field is really the great outdoors. It's not a big patch of grass. So just on the jetty we're sitting on, you do get examples of brain coral. And just around the corner here, a wonderful grove of elkhorn. So scientists can be working in the lab, designing the research, and then just get in the water to explore the amazing underwater abundance for themselves using scuba gear, and perhaps going even deeper on the reef using rebreathers. And it's really special to be at Kamabi, near the reef, because it's such an extraordinary habitat. The diversity of color, the diversity of species, the amazing coral that creates this underwater city. And so it's with great delight I welcome Kristen to Coral Live. Uh, really, Hi everyone! Really it's good to see you again! Really, Hi, um, hi. <laughs> thank you so much for being part of this Meet the Expert session. I'm dying to introduce you fully to the, to the students, but we're just going to give, first of all, a few shout outs uh, cool. to some of the classes watching awesome. and then we'll get into the session uh, fully. Uh, so we have uh, schools from India, UK, Morocco, Ukraine and USA. Uh, we have a big shout out to DPS and that's a school in Bangalore in India. Hi to all the students there. Uh, Hi. Really looking forward to getting through some of your questions. Uh, we have hello to the students of the American School of Tangier in wow. Morocco. Oh my gosh. Hello. Hi, Hi there. Morocco. So racking up the continents. <laughs> yeah, I've, most, I've never been to any of these places. Uh, really big thank you uh, to the students and teachers at Oakdale junior school and they're joining us from okay. the U joining us from the UK. Yes. Uh, okay. We have I think it's Kentucky. I think we have Union Point Academy uh, in the US. And um, brilliant that you can join us. So hi, hi to all the students there. <laughs> and a massive, massive hello um, to all students and staff at St Richard's Catholic College and that's on Bexalon Sea in England. Amazing. Hi St Richards. Really, really wonderful to have you all. Um, Kristen, uh, one of the researchers here at uh, Kamabi, uh, how, <laughs> I know you do so many amazing things, but how would you sort of summarize maybe your role here and, and sort of what kind of work you do? What I do, well as, as part of the Kamabi family, um, my job is to host visiting scientists who are coming through for short trips or long trips, and then I also run a little research group of my own and our focus is really trying to understand how corals reproduce. But as you've, as you've seen throughout the week, there are quite a few people here who are studying corals and different aspects of their reproduction. So even though I'm in charge of a little tiny part of it, it's, it's mostly one big huge family trying to learn new things and discover new things and invent new things. And I was just telling Jamie earlier that the whole Kermabi family has been talking all week long about uh, all the great questions they're getting this week. 
So um, I'm pretty excited to hear which questions you guys saved for me. But I've been thinking about all of the other questions you asked all week long as well. Well, we've got some really special ones uh, lined up. Um, just we're gonna. You've got some amazing bits of kit here, and I'm really, you know, great to get into this. Today we're, we're also talking about adaptation, and we'll get into that in a bit. But just to provide some context, um, you work specifically on on coral and the coral animal itself. Why is that animal so important? Why is that animal so important? That's a question I get a lot. I actually care about them. I think they're important just because they're so weird and so cool and so interesting. They're so weird. We'll see that in a second. I brought you guys some really weird, really cool corals. But they're also important because they give us all sorts of benefits. We get food from coral reefs. We, we discover new medicines on coral reefs. And they're so pretty. They're, to me, the prettiest thing on Earth. So part of the reason that I want to understand them is so I can help them make their art. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. And you very, very kindly um, brought us, a, a, and I can term this, correct me if I'm wrong, some of your babies. I brought you guys some baby corals. <laughs> Maybe a two, like a two-year-old coral and some one-year-old corals. And then if they behave themselves enough on camera, if they don't get stage fright, we're also going to try to feed them. Oh, that is... Oh, that's have you guys ever fed a baby coral before? <laughs> I have to do that every day, but you feed it's still corals, cool. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and um, we've... Because I'm really interested, because I mean, the coral is a very peculiar animal in some ways, and in other ways it's related to a whole host of animals that students might have come across absolutely. already in the sea. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're just like any other animal in that they have to eat, and they have to survive, they have to avoid being eaten, they have to find a mate, they have to grow, and the reason that they're weird is that they're also just stuck to the bottom of the ocean, they can't move, they have to sort of sting to protect themselves, and then they, you know, make copies of themselves. So in some ways they're very strange animals and it's hard to understand what they need and what they want. And in other ways they're just like a dog or a cat or a mouse or a, a kid. You know, they get hungry, they get cranky, they get scared. Okay. And they grow. And they grow. <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated by, by what we've got here. Is it possible that we can um, maybe try and get this on camera and, and talk us through sort of maybe some of the anatomy, some of the different parts. Yep. I think we're going to use this big guy here first. Okay. We're going to put him in front of Ellie's super zoom camera. So let's put this guy here. He's got his tentacles out. I should say he or she because we don't actually know if this is a male or female coral. Can you tell? So with this one, we can't tell unless we actually watched it spawning and reproducing. Okay. That's one real mystery in coral science is sometimes we still can't tell whether they're males or females. And some corals are males and females at the same time because there's just no rules for corals. <laughs> there's just no rules. So Ellie's going to super zoom in on our maize coral. This is called Meandrina meandrites. Okay. Also known as the maize coral. And this one is probably only two years old. And when we found it on the reef, we said... We're going to put this one in our display tank, in our demo tank, so that we can learn from it. It just had one mouth right in the middle, uh -huh. a bunch of flesh around it. Okay. And since we brought it into the wet lab about six months ago, it's made a bunch of mouths all around its middle mouth. <laughs> so, so if you just sat somewhere and then started making mouths around your mouth, that's basically what it did over the last six months. Super cool. And so we've got that up um, at the moment. And we can sort of lean, o lean over a here? bit and peek in. All right, we're going to peek in. And um, so stop, so to talk us through, so we, I can see um, the... My official scientific pointer. Yes. The most important tool in science is the pointer. So here's our main mouth. I'm trying not to touch the coral because I might scare him, her, it. So there's one big mouth in the middle here that's kind of long and orange. And then if your eyes are really sharp, you can see all these little tiny mouths around the central mouth. I don't even know how many there are. There's maybe six or eight or nine by now. And those all formed in the last few months just mm -hmm. by budding from the sides of the colony. And then you can probably see the tentacles sticking out. In fact, yeah. if I touch this one, it might 
might react. Oh, there it goes. It's trying to go for you. It's, it's actually trying to sting the pointer. It's like, is this food? Is this food? I'm hungry. This coral hasn't had breakfast yet. And then maybe you can see, depending on the, the angle, all this brown tissue around the edge, mm -hmm. that's all of its skin filled with its symbiotic algae. So it's, you destroy the symbiotic algae piece in there as if, if it's yeah. perfectly normal for yeah. an animal to have a plant <laughs> growing inside it. Yeah, What's it would that be like, about? here's my lettuce. It just lives in my skin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, corals have algae that live in their skin and it makes them some sugar. It makes them a little bit of food. And it also probably helps them in the sun as kind of a form of sunscreen to have a cells in your skin that are doing something with the sun's rays mm -hmm. and not just letting the sun's rays burn you and scorch you to death. So the brown color that you see is almost mm -hmm. entirely those algae. And I think zo from zoxanthellae is, I think, the Greek word that means Wild yellow animal. or something. Oh, okay. Oh no, Sam that's xanth. That's the xanth in yes. zoxanthellae is the yellow. yellow. So zo is animal and yellow is the, the xanth. <laughs> so if this coral is unhappy, it's almost pure white. It'll spit out all of those symbiotic algae and it'll just be pure white. But the color it has now is from all of its algae cells in its skin. And, and we've, we've got some um, primary schools watching. We use a really great word there, symbiotic. Symbiotic. Yeah, symbiotic is sort of the opposite of parasitic. Paras you, might ha you might have an idea of what a parasite means, right? Something or someone takes advantage of someone else. A symbiosis is a, a relationship where both sides are benefiting and cooperating and achieving something bigger and more valuable than they could on their own. So we talk about symbiosis between people or between communities or between humans and the planet, but we can also talk about a symbiosis between the coral and its algae. Brilliant. It looks like this coral is sticking its tentacles out a little bit more and a little bit more. So I think we're either going to look at it under fluorescent light or we're going to feed it. But I don't know which one we're doing first. Uh, it, it's super Genius. hungry. Let, let's not expose <laughs> it to um, UV light before it's had breakfast. Before it's had that, breakfast. that would be slightly unfair. It's super hungry. All right. In that case, we brought this little tiny jar of little tiny pieces of food. This is just little bits of fish and little tiny bits of mussel. You might have had mussels in garlic butter or <laughs> mussels on a veg de mer pizza, but the corals will eat that too. And I have to find my tweezers. Which are around somewhere. They were beside the they, food. They were beside the food. So I get up, if you, if you um, talk a little we bit about just... um, the typical sort of food that the, the coral polyp eats with its tentacles, I will search out the tweezers. I also have these huge tweezers, so we could just make this okay. ridiculous and we can use these humongous tweezers. Great. How's that? This is for something else, but we're going to use these huge tweezers since we lost the small ones already. All right, so we've got little bits of fish and little bits of mussel, and this coral has like 10 mouths in its hungry. Should I hold those up for you so the... Sure, we can. We're just going to take... I mean, maybe we'll just start with this really big piece and make a point. Here's this sort of medium-sized piece. Okay, let's try something. We're going to put this sort of near the tentacles and we're going to see if it grabs the food and see what it does. It just grabbed it out of the tweezers. I kind of let go, but it also grabbed it. This is a really big piece of food, actually. No way. Oh, did you see it? It's getting pulled toward the coral. The tentacles are grabbing and on and pulling and squeezing. And now what it's probably trying to figure out is which mouth is going to eat this piece of food, or is it going to share them? Or are all the tentacles just going to work on dissolving it for a little while? And so how, how do those tentacles work? Are they just like arms, or they've got any special tricks up their sleeve, as it were? <laughs> they've got some pretty cool special tricks. They're like arms. They can reach out and they can retract, but then they're covered in stinging cells. So it would be like if you had uh, like bumblebee stingers all over your arms and whatever food came by, you could just go and then bring to your mouth. The, the cells that do that are called nematocysts. And that's actually the, the way we tell corals from other animals is that, that they have nematocysts along with jellyfish, along with fire corals, along with anemones. So those stinging cells are really, really important because they can't go to the store and buy a muffin for breakfast 
They can't walk to the kitchen to look through the fridge for breakfast. They just have to sit there and try to try to snatch their breakfast from the water column while it's whooshing by. And, and is that normally big bits of muscle that might be whooshing by, or is there a particular type of food that, that out on the reef this, this wee one would be typically getting? That's a good question. Do they just eat pieces of uh, fancy frozen mussels from the grocery store? No. <laughs> the, the, typically a coral eats much tinier pieces of food. They'll eat little tiny zooplankton, little tiny copepods, or small worms. They can eat phytoplankton, which is little bacteria, little little tiny single cells in the water column. But they're also opportunistic. You have to be if you can't move, if you're stuck to the bottom, you don't really have much in terms of eyes. So they have to be pretty opportunistic. So if a little bit of, uh, say a fish eats another fish and a little bit falls to the bottom onto a coral, a coral will grab that and chew on it for a while. A little piece of a shrimp, they'll eat that. They'll eat a lot of different stuff. And they're pretty, it's pretty obvious what they like and what they don't like. If you offer them something they're not willing to eat, they might sort of touch it for a while and then let go. And they might try to eat it and then just puke it back out. <laughs> so they know what they're doing. They can taste for sure. They're not uh -huh. going to eat things that aren't food. I can see it really being taken in there. Whoa, there it goes. So the, the polyps on the left are sort of helping. The polyp on the bottom left is trying pretty hard to eat the piece of muscle. And the middle polyp is sort of saying. So they know, don't have oh, they don't guys. have teeth. So how are they eating that? Is that is that just using a chemical to, or enzymes to digest it? It's yeah, exactly. It's using chemistry. So if you're trying to smush something into tinier pieces, you can use physics, right? You yeah. can smash something like with your teeth, or you can use chemistry, which is like acid and enzymes and chemicals, which is what your stomach does. So corals don't really have any kind of teeth or any crunchers or any grinders. So they just skip straight to a uh, chemical attack. <laughs> so the, they have the, the stinging cells in their tentacles and then their digestive systems have filaments that we call mesenteries. And those are covered in enzymes that are just shredding the proteins and the lipids and the okay. sugar support in the food. Oh, wow. So it's an all out um, chemistry, chemistry attack. Perfect. It's the same way our stomachs work actually. They have a little stomach and we have a little stomach and you use, you use chemicals to break the food into tinier food. Brilliant. And I think um, if I th one of the amazing things that we were looking at yesterday is, is what these polyps look like uh, in different types of light. Oh, yes. Yeah, we can look at this under a sort of special blue light and see the coral's sort of native fluorescence. What you see right now is what we would see if we went to a reef. It's just the brown mm -hmm. color of the symbiotic algae and kind of yellowish color of the tentacles. But corals are, well, like we said, kind of weird and kind of different from other animals. And so one of the other, one of the other uh, things that's going on in their tissues all the time is they have little tiny fluorescent proteins. Mm -hmm. And they use those as a form of sunscreen. And we think that they may also use those for sort of helping them do photosynthesis some of them we don't even know what they do. And what's really cool is that we can see that fluorescent light too, or those fluorescent colors, if we shine just the right color light on the coral and then put just the right filter on our eyeballs or on our camera. Okay. I brought Jamie some uh, yellow goggles. Amazing. We Thank brought, you very much. We brought Ellie's camera some yellow goggles. Go. So we're going to put these on the camera first, and it's just going to look kind of funny in yellow. There we go. Oh, I just dropped Ben's really nice lens onto the pier. This is live camera jiggering, guys. There we go. All right, so now Jamie and the camera have our, the yellow filter. It's a whole different world. A whole different world. <laughs> it looks kind of spacey, huh? Kind yeah. Of, kind of high tech. Wow. And then we have one light bulb somewhere. Aha, there we go. Now we have this kind of regular underwater flashlight. I'll take it off. That's just a little bit, <laughs> a little bit intense for the morning. <laughs> it's very yellow when you look through that. We have this flashlight that has, that makes really, really bright blue light. So look at that. So all the other wavelengths of light are squeezed out and it just sends out this super bright blue light. So we're going to shine that on the coral. Those blue lights, blue 
blue wavelengths are gonna hit the fluorescent protein in the coral and then bounce back out of the coral and then we're gonna see a really bright and brilliant because we've got these yellow filters on our, our eyeballs. All right, Jamie's ready. He's a little dizzy from how yellow the world looks right now. And Ellie's camera is ready. It's got the yellow light. Now we're gonna move this over here oh. and see what we can see. Whoa! No way. Whoa, it's a fluorescent coral eating breakfast. Look at the My life is made, <laughs> Kristen. This is just so cool. It's a pretty cool job, I have to say. I'm like, this is a pretty cool job. Hey, we just saw a tentacle move. Do you guys even see where the food went? I don't even see it in it's, there. It's still, it's, it's wrapped around. It sort of feels, it looks like it's got this um, fluorescent sort of wrapped around it already. So it must be being pulled in. Chomped in there. Chomped in there. You can see the mouths are a little bit of a different color than the tentacles. Yeah, they're sort of brighter. And then there's a, the sort of reddy stripes around. There's some reddish pigment. There's the bright, bright fluorescence on the ends of the tentacles and do we do we know why there's these different fluorescence fluorescent colors in different parts fluorescent zones we don't yeah. really know we often see a really bright fluorescent edge if a coral is growing rapidly so it could be part about it could be helping to protect really new really delicate tissue from the sun from from stress but for the most part, we don't really know why there's a lot of green in one place and a lot of orange in another place. That's still a pretty big question. Amazing. Absolutely pretty amazing. Pretty cool, huh? You can go on a scuba dive at night with goggles like this and a flashlight like this, and the whole reef is crazy technicolors. Oranges and reds and greens. It makes you appreciate even more what awesome animals these are, because you shine this light on me in the dark, I don't... It just looks like you're shining a blue flashlight on me in the dark. So I'm just gonna... <laughs> it's a little weird looking through yellow sunglasses in the bright Caribbean sun. <laughs> it is, I definitely, but this is this has to be one of those moments seeing a fluorescent coral having breakfast. Eating breakfast. You can also see that the tentacles are pretty puffy and a lot mm -hmm. more of the tentacles are out. And that's probably because the coral found this piece of food and now it thinks there might be more around. So it's probably sort of feeling around in the water column trying to figure out if more food is going to come by. Incredible. It's so pretty. I could just sit here and watch this for the rest of the video, but that would be a pretty boring video for everyone else. Let's, um, we are marching on. I know that we have marching huge on. amounts of questions for you. Um, should we just have maybe have a see if we can see one other one of the single polyps and then i think we'll, we'll, then get, we'll, take, we'll some questions. take some questions yeah absolutely so in addition to this uh big big fat coral eating breakfast i brought you guys a few one-year-old corals from last year last uh -huh. year we showed you a little tiny jar full of swimming coral babies yes and now they're one year old oh, and so great. we can show you what a one-year-old coral is up to oh. All Amazing. right, so, so we're going to rejigger at least camera a little bit. Going to get rid of our fluorescent light. Should I move this this big guy to one side move gently? Move that guy. So it might catch the microphone. Oh. Okay. And then, let's see, should we go for the middle one? I will let's go for the middle one. The middle one is... I'm going to go like... How's that, Ellie? Ellie says perfect. So maybe I should put my, I'm gonna point at this just for scale so that you can see. There we go. So this is a coral that's one year old. Mm -hmm. It was born maybe October or November last year. So one year and maybe a few more weeks. Mm -hmm. We raise the larvae in the lab. We helped get them to attach to a surface and go through metamorphosis. And then we started feeding them, helping them get their symbiotic algae, helping them get acclimated to water with more and more bacteria in it. And we've been keeping them in our laboratory system to see what we can learn about corals in this really early stage when they're really fragile. And one of the reasons we care about that is that this process of coral reproduction doesn't happen in the ocean as much as it used to. So we're trying to figure out how we can help them all the way through. 
Okay. So this little guy, this little girl, actually this one is a is a guy and a girl because this species is a hermaphrodite. This little girl is not even the size of my fingernail, but it's a year old. It's making its skeleton. It's got a big fat mouth. It's got a bunch of tissue and it's slowly spreading across the tile. So any day now, it will start to make another mouth, start to stretch out. And this one's actually gonna grow into a brain coral. So it's gonna make big ridges just like this. Let's give it five more years and it's gonna look like that. Right now we're just one tiny little dot and one tiny little, tiny little edge. Just give it like five years in a safe place to live. <laughs> <laughs> and that one we could try to feed it as well and to be honest i have no idea what's going to happen we can try to give it the Definitely. teeniest weeniest little piece of food and see if it grabs it and see if not with my mega monster tongs the tongs are like bigger than the coral is all right You don't have to have really, really good fine motor skills as a scientist, but if you do, it's a, it's a big benefit. You don't have shaky hands. All right, we're gonna take this little tiny piece of muscle and we're gonna see if we can feed it to this baby brain coral. Okay, little buddy. Yeah, did it grab it? Maybe. That's a really big piece of food also. Should we see what we can it. see uh, on the... UV? Would that be a... Uh... Let's try it. Let's see if we can watch a fluorescent baby coral eat breakfast. We put this here. We need our, our filter back. Oh, the yellow filter is probably not making it very easy to see. And we can make this brighter too. There we go. Whoa! Aha, uh -huh. so I can see the tentacles starting to stick a little bit out of the, of the polyp more than usual. And those are the, the green dots we can see? Uh huh. And you can see the whole body is kind of pulling inward as well. So it's trying to surround this piece of food and kind of buy itself some time to figure out how to get its mouth around this piece of food. It's pretty amazing the sizes of, of food that corals can eat compared to their body size, but they have to be really flexible because there might be a day with almost no food in the water, and then there might be a bunch of stuff in the water column the next day. So they have to be able to eat really fast and get as much food as they can, and then sort of wait through until the next wave of food comes. So this one's working really hard to eat a humongous breakfast in case there's no other food for the rest of the day. Listen, thank you. I mean, so, so much. I wish we could just spend the next hours just feeding coral Me babies <laughs> and, and you know, looking under the, at them under the fluorescence. Uh, what I'd love to do, and maybe we can come, come back to this, but just, just where we are at the moment, should we see what we can... Um, sh how many questions, these amazing questions that we've got coming through. Absolutely. And um, I know we've got some video questions, but we might just whiz through them uh, just to make sure we can get as many as we can um, we have DPS in Bangalore um, and this uh, brilliant questions um, we're talking here um, they're obviously are worried about microplastics um, and are there any um, aquatic plants or animals which could reduce the effects of plastic on other organisms oh, and that's from Abel Asher that is a great question. Plastic is something people talk about a lot right now because we're finding it almost anywhere we look in the ocean. And for me, maybe even scarier than the, the plastic itself is the fact that we managed to change every single liter of the ocean. No matter where you go anywhere on Earth, if you scoop water, filter it, go through with a microscope, you find little tiny bits of plastic, which means we also can change its chemistry. We can change its temperature. The ocean is not too big for us to change. We, we pretty much change the whole thing. But there's a ton of research now to try to figure out how we, how we address this. And I don't know if there are many plants or animals that are, are going to be really good at helping us get rid of plastic, but I think there are some bacteria that might be able to help. I really recently read about um, a new kind of bacteria that's potentially able to eat polystyrene, which is that really clear uh, kind of 
bendy plastic or you see it used in um, styrofoam like yes. in food packages so it turns out that maybe bacteria could help us get back to where we started with all the stuff that we turned into plastic yeah, thank you very very much and specifically on, on the coral reef uh, a follow-up question from Abalasha. Um, do we see impacts of microplastics on on coral animals for instance oh also a good question um, I think I think people have seen corals eat tiny bits of microplastic. I think maybe corals have an advantage in the fact that they just have a stomach and they just eat and whatever they don't want, they just spit back out their mouths. So I think corals are actually pretty good at going, oh, that part's not food, and then just spitting it back out. So luckily, some animals are not nearly as, uh, as, as at risk from eating plastic as things like seabirds or turtles where things get stuck and they can't get them back out of their stomachs. Uh, this is brilliant questions. Um, is it true that uh, oxybenzone present in sunscreen can harm the coral reef? Oxybenzone. Should we, should we stop wearing sunscreen if we're, or certain types of sunscreen if we're going snorkeling oh, or diving? Yeah. That's a huge issue. It's a huge question, a huge topic of discussion lately. Is this a, is this a chemical that's harming the reef? What do we do? It's really hard to tell, right? Because the ocean is humongous and humans have done about 20 really mean things to the ocean. We're heating up the planet, we're taking all the fish out, we're putting in sewage, we're putting in fertilizer. And on that list also, we're putting in a bunch of chemicals that we call endocrine disruptors, which means they're chemicals that change the hormones of animals. So it changes when they'll go through puberty, it might change whether they can smell another male or female, it might change how their whole bodies develop. And there's some evidence that oxybenzone could be one of these endocrine disruptors. So for me, I think it's probably wise for humans to say, I don't want those kinds of chemicals in my world, for me, and for every other organism. But I don't think it makes sense to blame every person on every beach and every bottle of sunscreen they bought. Uh, for, for what's happening in the ocean. We should have chemical safety laws that protect us from endocrine disruptors, and we should have governments that are brave enough to protect oceans and protect coral reefs so that we don't have to trust every single person's every single sunscreen moment I mean, but to we, and, help. And it's great that we've done that with chemicals like PCBs, yeah. that, you know, that, that we are doing it and we'll continue to do it. So it's not that we've been negligent as a whole, but the, the problems keep evolving. Absolutely. We have a good record of noticing that something is dangerous and taking it out of, out of our environment. Lead as well. There used to be a lot of lead in gasoline and everyone would breathe it. It was affecting people's IQs. There's lead in water supplies in some places and there's a lot of work to, to remove that now. So it's another example of where we finally notice that there's a problem and the best solution is for governments and countries as a whole to switch to new alternatives. Amazing. We've got uh, so many great questions uh, from DPS, but I want to get a couple from some other schools as okay, well. Okay, great. Um, Siren Sester, and just to, to go, go for it, uh, Casey, what are the common colors on the reef? That's from Casey. The common colors. Here we have a lot of oranges and browns and yellows. There's some purple, there's some pink, there's some white. If you go to the Pacific, there's some corals that are just crazy fluorescent green or crazy fluorescent purple. It's all kind of muted. It's not too crazy multicolored, but it's pretty diverse. Lots of pastels. Um, Jen would like to know, amazing, have you seen an octopus on the reef? And how do they camouflage themselves? Oh, good one. I saw, I was on a dive last week and I saw three octopuses uh -huh. all doing different stuff. One was just reaching all of its tentacles into holes and I felt bad for whatever was in the holes because it was just hunting with, yep. hunt, can you imagine being in the water in the dark and just putting your arms in a hole and then, and then eating whatever you found? Oh, <laughs> it's terrifying. Brilliant. Um, so I saw three octopuses last week actually. And I know a little bit about how they camouflage themselves, but there are scientists whose whole career is to study that. And we know they can change the texture of their skin mm -hmm. to match if it's sort of a grungy algae reef or a flat sandy reef. And we also know that they can see their color surroundings and then they have little, um, little cells in their skin that can open and close to sort of change the color pigments. So their eyeballs see what's around them and then their skin kind of knows to be excited in a certain way so that their skin matches. How cool. It's like the Harry Potter invisibility cloak, uh -huh. but for algae and corals and sand. And brilliant, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so, um, 
we're going to come back to some questions we missed out at the end if we've got time but f uh, from Rebecca how are fish in hot water adapted differently from fish in cold water oh that's interesting how are fish adapted differently to hot and cold water I've heard a little bit from my friends who study deep sea creatures uh -huh. that there's some special stuff you have to do in your blood if you live in the deep sea and up north and up north oh, yeah in, in the, the Arctic deep <laughs> north, or up north <laughs> All I can think about is places that here here that are, are colder, and one of them is the bottom of the ocean. There's a there's a few tricks that fish have if they're in really cold water. Say you're in water that's almost freezing, your blood could freeze, your skin could freeze. So they have special molecules in their skin that are a kind of antifreeze that makes their blood move more fluid, even though it's so cold. And what I find fascinating about the polar oceans is because of the salt content. We, we, we think about water freezing at zero degrees Celsius, but in fact it's freezing about minus 1.7 <laughs> degrees down there. So it's below normal freezing of fresh water. It's really um, cold. When it's really cold. It sounds really hard to be a fish underneath a glacier at the poles. It's just pretty hard being a scientist. <laughs> it's really hard being a human down there, too. Um, we've got an additional shout out to the students of Mount Kelly, Tavistock, uh, UK. Mount Kelly. Hi, everyone at Mount Kelly. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to ask you, because we've got five minutes left and about 38 questions. Can we just go really fast? We're, we're going to go speed, speed round, round. Speed I'm round. I'm going to be terrible at this. Okay, so Richard's Catholic College. Uh, when tourists this. visit coral reefs out at sea, such as the Barrier Reef, um, they're saying that there can be harmful fuels. How do we get out to explore the reef without harming them? Oh, um, boat engines are getting way more efficient. Uh, probably someday we'll have like electric boats the way we have electric cars. Um, Row, sail. Yeah, swim. <laughs> we have a reef here that's only two minutes from shore, so we just swim. Um, how do coral polyps produce the calcium carbonate, or how do they take the calcium carbonate from the water and make their uh, reef? These are really hard speed round questions. <laughs> there's carbonate in the water and there's calcium in the water, and the corals get both of those in their skin and then do a little chemistry magic and then squeeze this calcium carbonate mineral below them themselves. Perfect. <laughs> uh, would a coral <laughs> reef uh, be able to survive without algae? Not without their symbiotic algae in their skin. Yep. Um, and there's some useful stuff that algae does. We don't need a lot. We don't need really toxic algae, but they need a little bit. They need a little bit. And we'll come on to coral bleaching with Renee just after this, which more yeah. on that relationship. Yep. Um, do you, Dan would like to know, can we genetically modify coral to save reefs from extinction due to warming during, due, to, due to climate change? Scientists are working on how coral genes work so that maybe someday they can help in that direction, but it's a really long process and it's a really huge ocean. So we've got to do a lot of stuff in the meantime first. Okay, Jason wants to know, uh, why don't fish have hairs? Why don't they have hairs? Yes. Why don't we have hairs? Well, actually there's some in my arms. <laughs> because they're not mammals. <laughs> is, that, is that the answer? I, I think well, mammals have hairs. Is it just mammals that have hair? I okay. don't know why fish don't have hair. Not useful. I mean, mammals have hair. Often you look at uh, species uh, on land to trap uh, oh, air next to their Oh, it's because they're not trying to stay warm. It's because they're cold-blooded. Ah, see, Jamie knew this, but I didn't know the answer I'm, to that one. This is what we're, 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 we're hypothesizing here. Uh, okay, we have um, Shrijani. Um, why can't there be an artificial cross-feeding of corals and sponges? Oh, they're so far away. It would be like you having a baby with a oak tree. Yeah, they're really distantly related. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> what is the maximum age a coral can live um, till? And that's from Abinav. We don't know for sure, but it's thousands of years, at least. And those are deep ones or all these ones? Even on the reef. <gasps> Even if wow. they look like little pieces, they may have been a, a coral that broke and rolled apart and grew again and broke and rolled apart. Okay. And we have some genetic methods that show us they're thousands of years thousands old. Thousands of years old. Um, Abinav would also like to know and this is, I'll put you on the spot, which type of coral is the most valuable and why? Valuable, we talk a lot about the major reef builders, the ones that build the biggest structures. So the corals here, there's two branching corals and there's a few really big boulder corals and we consider those the most valuable because they build the biggest stuff for us. So that's looking at the, the ecosystem role of, of corals as habitat builders. Yeah. So the ones who do most of that, yeah. most valuable. 
awesome. Uh, <laughs> this, these are great. I love these this. Are, is quick these round. Are hard questions. Uh, CMR would like to know. We have the technology of 3D printing organs. Uh, why can't we 3D print uh, corals? And why can't we do that? Oh. And what challenges might we face if we wanted to do that? It's a huge ocean. Corals are pretty complicated. And they've got a lot of funny different cell types that we don't totally understand. You want to, if you want to 3D print skin, there's a few cell types, but are you going to make collagen? Are you going to make mesenterial filaments, GFP? It's just very complicated. So even though it's a, it's a larger animal, printing one organ is fewer cell types compared to printing a whole animal. I think so. <laughs> um, Wow, we are going to. This got way harder compared this is, this to last is, year. This is got. This is you're great. These are these are the amazing <laughs> questions. Um, I am uh, going to go something that, that looks at ecosystem balance. Okay, this is from Sima. Just like humans take antibiotics when infected with bacterial diseases, can we treat corals which are sick from bacterial infection from disease? Uh, with antibiotics without harming the corals or is there another way? Great question. Some corals that are sick from bacterial diseases we can actually treat with antibiotics but there's just a few diseases we can do that with and only a few antibiotics we can do that with uh, so we need better methods than that but there's some cases where antibiotics do actually work for corals. Can I ask a question about sponges in this, in this regard? Do sure. sponges help take bacteria out of the water. Does oh, it, interesting. Does yes. That, does that put a natural sort of like de-diseasing of, of the reef? We always want filter feeders taking plankton out of the water column and turning them into stuff on the coral reef. Um, so sponges do help clean the water a little bit. So do giant clams. So do other corals. Corals filter feed too. Um, and then what else helps is not putting like poop and fertilizer into the ocean, which gives you all the bacteria to start with. And the final question that we have time for from the amazing DPS school in Bangalore. Why are corals found where they are? Oh, why are corals found where they are? It's really hard to live in the ocean. It's really hard to live stuck to the bottom. It's hard to live using the sun as your food. And corals found out they were best at living in really clear water where they could fight for food with their crazy stinging cells. They're not very good at living in cold water where there's lots of food and lots of other organisms that can grow faster. So their, their perfect habitat is really clear water, really, their advantage of catching every little bit of food that's in the water, and then the ability to just grow really slow and steady for a super long time. So the tropics, clear water in the tropics is usually the place that they do the best. And then anything we do to make it the wrong temperature or grungy or mucky just sort of slows them down in their projects. Kristen, I can't believe how much we've managed to get through in just 45 minutes. Me either. <laughs> it's been an, uh, such a massive treat to be able to show um, feeding coral babies uh, such an amazing thing to see them under the UV light and to explore some of the fluorescence there. Your amazing experience uh, of explaining the reef, studying the reef, sharing all that insight, and then this the trickiest, gnarliest, most interesting questions. I wish we were here all day. We were a day of, you know, feeding coral babies and getting into these really interesting topics. Thank you so much for all your wonderful questions. Um, and thank you so much, um, Christian, for, for being part of Coral Live again this year. It's Thanks been an absolute me, treat. Uh, really has. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Seymour saying uh, his favourite animal is now coral. We'll see you here. One more. Go and get your degree. <laughs> come and come over. Or explore the, the reefs um, around the Indian Ocean as well. So many diverse coral habitats around the tropical regions of the world. Very sadly for now, it is uh, goodbye from Coral Live. Goodbye from us until... Well, 45 minutes we have Rene talking more about the threats caused by increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Until the next time, bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank bye you. Girls. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much.